Hi, this is uh, Vince Terrell, editor in chief, uh, editor in chief for Case Cardiovascular Imaging Case Report Journal from the American Society of Echo, sister journal to uh, Jace. And today I'm going to be speaking with uh, a dear friend and an excellent uh, expert in echocardiography, Sharif Naga, from Houston Methodist Hospital um, for a new author spotlight series. Uh, again, these author spotlight series are designed to be very short and focused on specific topics of interest. Uh, for journal readers and the society members. So welcome, Sharif, and thanks so much for speaking with me today. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and uh, to hopefully reach out to the case and Jace readers. Wonderful. So today's um, topic, I think, is really important. It's very timely, which is the multi-societal recommendations for MMI and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So over the next few minutes, we're going to be I think addressing some of um, the production of the guideline and how individuals that are watching this can incorporate the findings from the recent guideline document that you chaired and you were the first author for. Um, these QR codes in the background are opportunities for anybody who's watching this to go ahead and pull up the uh, journal. If you just click on the top one, you'll see the journal uh, article will come up and you could uh, review that while we're discussing it. And we may address some of these other figures that we thought were relevant to have in the background as well. Um, so again, uh, why don't you go ahead and start by telling us why this disease topic was chosen by the guideline committee at this time? So uh, in 2011, the American Society of Echocardiography in conjunction with other imaging societies uh, had a document uh, summarizing the applications of multimodality imaging in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Since then, there have been many developments in the field of imaging that affect the diagnosis of the disease, the prognosis, as well as uh, potential management strategies. And so uh, the guidelines committee, in conjunction with other uh, as councils of the society, thought it was timely to consider an update to the 2011 guidelines. Yeah, and I think there's been some interesting um, treatment changes as well that are coming down the pipeline that are going to continue to emphasize the importance of uh, this medicate uh, of this uh, diagnosis. So uh, that's going to be fascinating to watch too. You know, we often hear that guidelines are, you know, simply that they're just guidelines. But we realize you and I in our clinical practice that each individual patient is really unique. Um, kind of drives that message of precision medicine. Uh, so my question to you really is, how, how do you use guidelines in the management of our patients? And, and how do you suggest viewers uh, best use this guideline? Uh, guidelines sort of pro provide basics, if you would, about diagnostic and potential treatment aspects for the treatment of the disease. Uh, and they should be worked in or used as a tool in terms of individual patient care. Uh, they are what they are, just general guidelines, no matter how specific they can be, what matters most is what is most applicable to that patient. We thought uh, when the guidelines writing group was drafting it to divide it into sections, uh, the way patients present for their physicians. So a group of patients will be referred uh, either to follow up with once a diagnosis has been established or seen for the first time or referred because of a concern whether they have a disease or not. And imaging in this disease is a cornerstone. The diagnosis cannot be established without seeing the hypertrophied myocardium, as well as other abnormalities that can be present. And then the next step was to look at, once the diagnosis is established, what are the aspects that are needed from imaging to help guide the care. And in general, the disease is divided into those with obstruction and those without obstruction. And when we talk about obstruction, we talk about provocable gradients as well. And that's a key aspect. So the writing group devoted a good portion to showing how uh, to evaluate patients for the presence of obstruction. Uh, and then show what implication that may have on how they are further evaluated. The next piece was the risk stratification for uh, sudden cardiac death, which is very unfortunate for this disease, but nevertheless a concern for patients and their physicians. And the last piece were uh, sort of unique situations, not really unique for the 
world of view of HCM, but things that are specific to HCM that can also cross over to other conditions like coronary artery disease and chest pain. And then the treatment options, uh, be it with medications, surgery, or uh, septic reduction therapy, or uh, reduced approaches that decrease the mobility of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. So when one sees a patient figure out which of these stages of their evaluation they are in and always go over the findings with them and discuss the available treatment options. And many physicians who treat these patients will notice that uh, patients with this disease come very well prepared. They do a lot of reading and they come back also with questions after their visits. Uh, so that's how I use the guidelines, a background, and then I look what is the situation I am dealing with and what is applicable to this particular patient and what is the patient uh, willing to accept to do. Yeah, I think as a source document, something that we can sort of keep nearby, something we could access quickly to help drive consistency in our thought process, right? That we don't over, over, uh, overlook certain components. So I think the guidelines to me are just great opportunities for us to be more consistent and universal in our approach to care. And I thought this guideline really did a great job of being a document, sort of a source document, reference document that we could hold nearby. So I think the committee should be commended on putting together such a comprehensive tool for us. Um, you know, one of the things you mentioned, I think, about the three different sections, I thought was really an important um, component of this, which was kind of fun to read through. Um, and I know you touched on it pretty quickly as you went through that. But you know, the role that um, Echo plays sort of, I know you just did a journal uh, Echo Twitter uh, episode as well. Congratulations on that. But but one of the things, right, in, in, in the world of Twitter we learn is hashtag Echo first, right? And what that meant was Echo not alone, but Echo with all these other imaging tools. And, uh, you know, in, in, in my world, um, I used to be echo solely, and I slowly developed these tomographic skills like MRI and CT. And one of the unique things that came out from adding those additional tools was an understanding of the complexity of the regional hypertrophy that can exist in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that as an echocardiographer alone, I didn't know about. And I'm, I'm curious, I sort of had an aha moment when I began to understand that sort of counterclockwise uh, relative thickening from base to apex, when viewed from base to apex, that causes sometimes this very thick interlateral wall that I never saw on echo. And it even, if you think back, right, we used to call it IHSS and, and asymmetric septal hypertrophy. And now we realize it's actually much more complex than that. So, so to me, that was an aha moment about multimodal imaging. And I'm curious if you've either had those aha moments when you were preparing this document or just in your clinical practice that you could tell us about? Um, so the, the writing group had representatives from the American Society of Echo and from other sister imaging societies. And um, there was a consensus, as you just noted, that Echo would be the initial uh, approach in many cases, but that unique information can be obtained by other imaging modalities, particularly uh, CMR. Um, and they can identify, these other imaging modalities can identify the presence of hypertrophy or pathology that could be missed by echocardiography. Uh, nowadays in practice, it is very frequent that we start, yes, with the usual is we start with the echocardiogram, but frequently we will also obtain CMR. Uh, and depending on the circumstances, may consider cardiac CT, but absolutely true and is part of the, uh, I would say, standard of care nowadays. Yeah. So so the three figures that I have in the background um, that I went ahead and put up, and I know I didn't talk to you before I put them out there. So I'm going to catch you a little bit off guard, but I'm just going to ask you a couple of thoughts related to those in case the viewers pull them up. So the first one says 2D measurements. That's where um, we learn that if we're not careful, we can measure the septum incorrectly. And it showed a nice example using, I think, MRI and echo about how you can align that measurement. Did you want to talk about that briefly? Yes. And actually that concern applies to all <clears throat> diseases where, or any patient that one is scanning and is imaging. 
you do not want oblique of axis off axis views because there these will end up with longer dimensions, sometimes thicker segments, and one may call hypertrophy when there is no actual hypertrophy. That would be a huge disservice to any patient. Could be normal for all we know, and we call them hypertrophy. Yeah. For hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the critical piece, in addition to avoiding these off-axis cuts and oblique measurements, is remembering to exclude RV thickness, RV uh, moderator band. Uh, and sometimes there are also bands in the LV outflow tract that may be better shown with slightly off-axis views. These have to be excluded. Otherwise, a septum that is, say, 1.3, 1.5 may end up 1.8. And that also has implications, for example, when you think whether septal reduction therapy is suitable or not. It is a good idea to go back and forth between para-long and para-short, uh, assuming the sonographer is working harder now to get good perpendicular cuts in the short axis views to see whether the dimensions and the thickness are matching on the paralong and the parashort views as well. It is also possible if I tried my best and the paralong is always off axis, but the parashort is a good cut, I can do the full thickness, the dimensions from the parashort. And I would use the paralong for the aortic root measurement. That's great. I think again, those are some great tips. And, and just quickly, the other two figures on there, if you could just tell us your quick thoughts on the lobster claw Doppler, right? That's one that I know sonographers sometimes get confused by. Can you tell us the quickly the etiology of that? Uh, so in ventricles with um, many patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have a di hyperdynamic ventricle, and that's the usual, by the way. The minority do not have it, and that wouldn't be a good thing. Uh, with obstruction, uh, forward flow takes place before the obstruction sets in and then the obstruction happens which uh, will result where the pulse wave Doppler sample being recorded dropping and then we see uh, because of that increased afterload the ventricle overcoming that side of obstruction and contracting more and we see another peak. Uh, it was actually first described by Dr. Mark Sherid and I believe it was a publication in the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography as well. I still remember that. There's like certain things that you sort of have these, like I say, aha moments sometimes. The lobster claw was one of those. That spiral architecture of the hypertrope published in another journal was another one for me. Um, and the other figure on there, we won't go through, but I'll just remind the viewers that they want to take a look at it. It really is a nice table, algorithmic driven, to show people the importance of the EKG as another tool that we have, a very simple tool to help drive the understanding of the presence of a hypertroph in some of these cases that are more borderline, you probably are going to have an abnormal electrocardiogram. You'd agree with that? Yes, absolutely. So wonderful. I really appreciate your time today. Is there anything we didn't talk about that you wanted me to ask you and I didn't ask you? No, I'm grateful for the opportunity today to, to speak with you and to the case readers and hope the readers go to the guidelines and read it. And if they have questions, you can post them and we'll be happy to interact together. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for your time today, your expertise. I, I hope that the uh, review, the, the viewers learned something new. I know that I did. I always learn when I talk to you. And uh, I'll leave you with a final thought, which is every case that you see today uh, has a teaching point and every teaching point out there is a potential new case publications to so send them our way. Thanks for your time. Thank you.